Great. So uh, today is lecture 20. And I'll continue discussing a little bit uh, polymers, simple models of polymers that do not grow. So I'm doing a bit of statistical physics of polymers. So today um, I'll finish that part. I give you a couple of um, more examples. And then if there is time, I'll start in the second part of the lecture uh, with models which show uh, polymers that are dynamic, that can grow, that can grow and shrink in span of time. So we will use the knowledge we got from stochastic process for this uh, model. So let me uh, continue. So this will be polymers three. Biopolymers. Biopolymers three. Um, and I will first give you, remember I was giving you models which were in 2D. So it was like a, a polymer in a, in a flat world. This is not the most realistic example, but we can also do um, models in three dimensions. So this is the first thing I will explain today, it will be the freely joint chain, another model. in three dimensions, okay? This will be the model I will begin with. So here, this model is extremely sim uh, similar to what I was discussing in 2D. So we have, uh, this will be the initial position. So the polymer is, is bound to this site. And then we have a sequence of vectors with the different links of the polymer. This is a two second vector, like this, like this, like this, this, this. And now we are living in a 3D world. So these vectors are three dimensional, all of them. And then like this. Okay, remember this will be R, the position of the end of the vector the polymer and we will assume that this is zero okay this is very very similar to what i discussed in the in the first model and uh, this will be the end-to-end -end distance okay uh, on top of that we will say that there is a load in the polymer this is a load at which we apply an external force so the force is pointing in the set uh, direction. We will say that this is x, this is y, and this is z. So the force is being uh, is pulling the polymer in the z axis. Okay. Uh, so something that just to remember is that all the vectors here a of j have modulus a that <coughs> the end point of the polymer as results from summing a of j all the vectors j equals one to n this is what you get when you're summing these vectors so you're traveling with, within these links and uh, i don't know what else <coughs> well i said that ai times aj they are independent when i is different to j. So now it's the same model as what I explained in the previous lectures, but in 3D. So it would be useful to use here, remember when we were in 2D, we were using polar coordinates. We had this angle and we had the radius, but the radius was always fixed because all of them have length a. We were using polar coordinates. But now it would be useful to apply spherical coordinates. And I will do a very brief reminder because this will be very useful for us. Spherical coordinates. <clears throat> so this is um, from physics bachelor's course, but it's important. The axis z, this is x, and this is y. And in spherical coordinates, we we do the following. We have a point. This point will be x, y, z. We 
characterize this point by three degrees of freedom. One is the radius, so the distance from the origin. This is called R. And then there are two angles. One is the angle with the vertical, theta. And the second is the angle with the x axis. So if you project this to the xy plane, you will have a point here. And this angle is called phi. Okay. Once you know this, it is very easy. Okay, first of all, which are the values that uh, r, theta, and phi can take? So first, uh, r is between zero and infinity. Okay, you can have a point very close or very far in the real distance. Theta goes from zero to zero to pi, and uh, phi goes from zero to pi. This is the conventional thing. Okay. Well, from here, you know very well that um, x is written like this. So x, we have to project this to the x plane and then project again in this direction. So you need r sine theta and then uh, r sine theta cos theta, cos phi. Sorry. For y, we have r sine theta, sine phi, and for z, we have r cos theta. Okay, this is the way we can convert from um, spherical coordinates to Cartesian coordinates. This is just a reminder, so it will be useful for you to remind this. Okay, so now uh, we say there is a force in the polymer. The force is pointing only in the z direction. It's a force in this direction. So this generates an energy for each configuration. So in mind, this is a very important reminder for you to connect with the statistical mechanics. Each configuration of the polymer will have a different energy. This is very important, okay? So in this case, the energy will be, the only energy that I'm considering is minus F times R. So this is because F is pointing in the set direction. R will be, remember, the 3D coordinates of the end of the polymer. Okay, this will be at X, Y, Z. Okay. But F is pointing in the set direction. So this is it. This is zero, zero, F. Actually, it's minus F. Can write like this. So all in all, what we get here is that we will have minus f times z, which will be minus the sum. Okay, what is said? Said is r, and r is the sum. So in the end, is the sum of a's uh, cosine. So z is a a cosine because each of them, the projection in z will be a cosine. So this will be minus f a cos theta j, j equals one. This is the energy of a given configuration. You see the configuration now has, how many degrees of freedom has one configuration? This is a question for all of you. Three. No. Can you repeat the question? How many? degrees of freedom has each configuration of a polymer. It, um, okay. Aren't they still the angles? Is it three to the power of n? Three to the power of n? Yeah, because we have n vector and each vector have a three, three degree of freedom. Yeah, but you have to be careful. Uh, aren't they the angles? That, aren't we considering the angles still? Yeah, exactly. Is the angle? oh, okay, okay. Two okay. Angles, because, then. Oh. No? The angle. Oh, no. okay, okay, okay. Just one angle or two angles? Okay. Yeah. It sure. is not about random guessing. It is about. No, because in the spherical coordinates, we have two angles, right? So are we considering one angle or two angles in this case? No, we are in 3D. So each of these vectors, you can put it in a sphere, but be careful because each vector is in a sphere with radius A. 
Okay. So the first vector, you only have two possibilities. Okay. Two possibilities. You have okay. Two okay. Three for the first vector. For this one, yes, yes, two. This one is in a sphere of radius a. So then it has only two degrees of freedom, theta and phi. Yeah. Okay. Two. But we have not one, not two, we have n. Uh, okay. okay. We have n vectors. Each of the vectors has two, two angles. So this is 2n. Not 2 to the power n. Be careful, eh? Be careful. So the number of degrees of freedom, let's say, okay, one configuration. Let me try. Um, so each configuration, each configuration. Is described by, we can write it like this, which will be theta phi. These are two vectors, well, or two collections of variables, which is we have theta one phi one, theta two phi two, to theta n phi n. Okay, this is a theta and this is a phi. So these are two n degrees of freedom. Okay. Very important, just for you to. It's not two to the power n. Okay, it's not two to the power n. Two angles times n variables. But if you look at the at the drawing I do, it's it's simple because you see when you start drawing the polymer. You start from the first vector and you see I'm moving in a sphere of radius i, a. So I only have, this would be equal to a for each of the vectors. And I just have the freedom of choosing this and phi. That's it. So this is one of the So if I give you n angles theta and n angles phi, you can draw the polymer. No, no problem. Okay. That's, that's what is called degree of freedom in the end. So, Given this, we can know the probability of each configuration of the polymer. We say the polymer is in a thermal bath at temperature T. It has fluctuations. So then it, it is described by the Boltzmann distribution, which in this case is P. The configuration is defined like this. This fully defines the configuration of the, the polymer. And this will be the partition function, the minus one, and then e to the minus beta. Remember, beta is one over KDP. E minus beta times the energy. The energy has a minus sign, so it will be e to the beta times this. So it will be e beta FA, the sum over j of course theta j. This is the probability for a given configuration of the polymer to take place uh, in the ensemble of polymers of that country. Okay. So this thing here you see is the exponential of sums can be written as a product. So this is okay and write one over theta if I want and then is the product from j equals one to n of e theta f a cos phi j. The nice thing here is there is no constraint of the angles. So each of the angles is independent from the other. This is a, a big simplification. It's a big simplification because I'm saying, so there is no bending energy. If, for example, I say, there's a polymer and there's a bending energy, the polymer doesn't like to be bent, then there will be an interaction between the different angles. Now I'm not taking this into account. Okay, it's a freely joint chain. This means there's no bending energy. There's no, this is not in the model. The, the model says all the angles are free, okay, and independent. This brings a big simplification and it makes things uh, easier. Um, but now I, I'm missing something, so give me <laughs> one second. And then this is the probability for configuration, distribution. 
So now all we need to know, as I said in the previous examples, is the partition function. Because with the partition function, we can calculate the average length of the polynomial. So the partition function here will be the following. So we will need to sum mainly this over different configurations. This is for one configuration, we have different angles theta. And now we need to sum over all angles. So we can write this in a compact way as follows. V omega uh, E theta F A sum J cross theta. J. Okay, what is this? This is the set of solid angles. Okay, so we have the solid angle for um, each of the elements, J equals one to one. So this is in reality D omega one, D omega. In practice, you should realize that all of these angles are independent. So we can write this as a product. There are integrals. Is a product, so this can be written as one integral to the power n. This is the same as saying the integral over v omega e beta f a cos theta to the power n. Right? We, you can call this set one because it's the partition function for one in the free. Okay. Okay, this happens when you are independent with the freedom. So now all that matters is to calculate this integral here. And uh, this is not so difficult with this third one. So the third one is um, we have to do the angle, the integral over all possible angles. This is a solid angle, so it is written as follows: pi goes from zero to two pi. And then there is the Jacobian from the transformation. So there is D, D theta, sine theta. This is from the Jacobian and going from x, y, z to theta pi r. This goes from 0 to pi. And then we have that. So it's just E to the uh, FA by the KVT times cos theta. Okay. Sometimes I write beta, sometimes I write one of KVT. For convenience. So now, how can we do this integral? The first thing is, you see cos theta. There is a theta here. There is a theta here. And this is phi. So we can integrate over phi because phi does not appear in the side. So there will be two pi. And next, what we can do is we can do a change of variable. We can. You see there is cos theta here. So we can call this. Um, Actually, x, x, and this is the derivative of this. So we change the variable from theta to x. When theta is zero, cos theta is one. When theta is pi, cos theta is minus one. So this will go from one to minus one, but this is the minus derivative. So this can be written only on as uh, very simply. The integral minus one to one <clears throat> of dx e to fa of kvt times x. It's just this integral. And this is a very simple integral. It's just the integral of e to the x. So this is three. Yeah. In this step, I just used that x is cos theta. Okay. It's a very simple change of variable. Minus one to one, right? This integral is extremely easy. You just have kvt over fa comes out. There is two pi kvt divided by fa, and then is e to the fa kvt times one minus e to the f minus fa kvt. And e to the alpha minus t minus alpha is the same hyperbolic. So what we get is something like this, which is e f a divided by kvt minus e minus f a divided by kvt. 
this thing here is twice the sign hyperbolic of FA divided by three. The sign hyperbolic of X is e to the X minus e minus X divided by two. So if you get something like e to the X minus e minus X is two sign hyperbolic. Okay, so that's it. This gives us the partition function. You can write it. Uh, one way to write it is four k, uh, four pi kVT. So you can write it like this. Two ways. But that's not nice. So one way is writing it uh, as follows. Would be four pi. KVT divided by FA, sine hyperbolic of uh, FA divided by KVT. Very important, when you have this type of sine hyperbolic exponents and so on, what it's inside the argument should be dimensionless. You see here, there is force length divided by energy. This is dimensionless. If something comes here and has units of length, you should worry. <laughs> this is important. This can be also written as 4 pi divided by alpha sine hyperbolic of alpha if you define alpha as you define it fa divided by qt. Okay. This is just the same thing, just introducing a dimensionless parameter that I call alpha. Okay, nothing. This is useful because later, what I want to calculate from here would be the average length. And having it in terms of alpha, it's quite useful, as you will see immediately. So now, what I'll do is, so I explained in my previous lecture, once I know the partition function, I know almost everything. So, what I do, we just take derivatives of, of the partition function, and from it, we get all the rest. Okay. So now I have the partition function, and I want to calculate the average volume of length, which is the same as the average end to end distance. The average polymer length, as I said, is L. In this case, it will be L set. Okay. It will be minus parcel H with respect to F. And I call H here, it's the energy. So it will be, this is a reminder of the previous lecture, KVT parcel log set with respect to F. And you can show that this is the same as saying. Same as A times parcel log of Z with respect to alpha. Okay, it's the same thing because alpha is FA divided by KVT. When you do the parcel derivative with respect to alpha, it's an A divided by KVT that goes up here and parcel with respect to F. Okay, it's a clever change of variable that makes things simple. So now we have this. We just need to take the derivative with respect to alpha. So if we go on with this, what we get is the following. So now uh, I need to take the derivative of this with respect to alpha. So what I get is the following. Uh, I forgot one thing. Okay, first of all, I remind you that Z, which I write it here is z1 to the power n. So if I take the derivative, so if I take log of z, log of z is n log of z1. Okay. Because z is z1 to the power n. So then there is an n that comes out, a n, and now I have to do log of z1 with respect to that. Okay. All I need to do is to compute the derivative of this. This is quite simple. 
And now uh, I continue. They have uh, AN. And the derivative that you get is the following. So it's a log. So the derivative of the log is the derivative of Z. So the anti this is parcel Z1 with respect to alpha divided by Z1. That's the derivative of the log. And that's simple. So the four pi will go. And the only thing that I need to take the derivatives is sine hyperbolic divided by half. That's the only thing. So what you get is a n, and then in the denominator I have a sine hyperbolic alpha divided by alpha. In the numerator I have alpha cos hyperbolic alpha minus sine hyperbolic alpha divided by alpha squared. So this looks a bit messy, but it's not that bad because the first term is alpha divided by alpha squared. This is one over alpha with one over alpha goes away and you just get cos hyperbolic divided by sine hyperbolic. So what you get is Na, so I can write it uh, something is Na. The first term I have cot hyperbolic of alpha, okay? This is cos hyperbolic divided by sine hyperbolic minus one over alpha. That's it, simple as this. Remember cot hyperbolic is cos hyperbolic divided by sine hyperbolic. So now we unfold the change of variable. So whatever there is alpha, we put this thing. And what we get is the following. So we get n kvt by the by f times this is place and kvt by f times fa kvt cot hyperbolic and hyperbolic of fa over kvt minus one. Okay. In other words, well, I think this is not the best. <laughs> Probably the best was when I, you can also write it as Na times cot hyperbolic of fa divided by kvt minus kvt. Na, which is like putting all the monomers one after the other, and there is a correction factor here, which looks like cot hyperbolic of x minus one over x. Okay, the quantity that appears here, the same as the inverse of this one. So it is not a trivial function, cot hyperbolic of x minus one over x, but what we can do is express this for low force. As the other day I said, what happens when the force is small? So here, the, okay, this will be the, the exact result. So if I tell you what is the average length of the polymer, it is this. This is a problem solved, okay, fine. But I also would like to understand limits, no? So the limit is when I'm pulling from the polymer with a not so strong force, when F, FA is small, with respect to KVT. In that case, I can do Taylor expansion. Just have to know that cot hyperbolic of x goes like uh, 1 over x plus x divided by 3 plus higher orders. So if you develop now cot hyperbolic, you will have 1 over x. So it will be KVT divided by FA. With the, the inverse of this, which will cancel with this. And the next term will be x divided by 3. It will be fa divided by 3 kvt. So this goes to f n a squared divided by 3 kvt. This is 
the average length with the force is not very very large okay so what you see is that the force is proportional to l this is related to what i was saying in the previous lecture like when you have a spring you pull from the spring the force goes like minus kx no? but in, in absolute value this is kx okay so you have a linear relationship between the force and the length when you have a spring. Polymers don't behave like springs in general, you see, because the length and the force are related by a nonlinear function. However, when the force is, is not very strong, there is a linear relationship between L and the force. Okay. And this gives us an effective stiffness. It looks like a spring when you pull not very strong from the polymer. So you can do F goes like K length and K, which is the coefficient that comes here. Let me call it effective. Effective stiffness is three cavity divided by NA squared. So the stiffness of the polymer depends on the number of monomers, how big are the monomers, and the temperature of the thermal bar. Okay. So when the force is small, you won't have a spring. It's not, it's not really a spring, it's something much more complex. So you have your polymer that is okay, whatever. You're pulling from it. But when the force is, is weak, you can describe this polymer like a spring. And the question here is how do you relate this spring constant with the properties of the polymer? And this is the answer. Okay. It relates to the temperature. It relates also to the number of monomers. It relates also to the, to the length of monomers. Okay. But in general, just important, the force length curve won't be linear because we have a system that has a lot of degrees of freedom, it has fluctuations, it is soft, like soft matter, it's not a, it's not a spring, it's something which is more rich, it has more, more details, and this is what we are learning. Okay, so this is a, a nice result, and I think it's, it's a good model. Any questions? Okay, something very important is, uh, you see, that when n is large, when n is large, this is like a, a spring that has zero spring constant. You can count like something like fluctuations are negligible, no? But we are considering n is not infinite. It's, it's a number of monomers. When you take a, a polymer, you don't take something like 10 to the 23. If something is small, is something that maximum has 100 monomers. So it's n is a number, it's a finite number. This is important, okay? Um, and this is it uh, for this small. Any question? Any question? All right, I hope it's clear. <laughs> I know that you don't understand. <laughs> so I will finalize this part of the physical physics of polymers with the last example, which has also correlations between the different angles. As I said here, this is a very simple model where all the angles are independent. But the more realistic model will be when it, the angle of one monomer is also related to the angle of the next monomer. But these, these models are more realistic, but they are more difficult to solve. I cannot solve it in most of them. I cannot solve it in two black ones. I will need a full lecture for that. So it's more advanced. But I can give you one appetizer to one model that I think I can, we can discuss in, in shortly. And this is what I'm going to talk now. This is called a kind of an icing model for a polymer. It's, it's a very simple one in one dimension. But at least it gives you an idea, no? Of course, the more complicated models, it, it reaches a point in which I cannot do it here with the with the 
uh, black holes that would be the computer to solve it. So the idea also is that I would like to <laughs> show you things that you can solve with a piece of paper and a pen, so, which is also important because then if you take uh, data from from a lab, if you have a formula, the formula is much more powerful than than just having a computer. So it's Useful, yeah. All right, so uh, let me go to one model, it's slightly different. The fourth model, it is the icing model of the polymer. Icing model polymer. This model incorporates elastic effects. Well, elastic effects could be bending, stretching, twisting, but it would be a very simplistic point of view. It's a 1D polymer. With N links. Length A. Each of the links is length A. Um, to simplify the model, in which uh, each link has a state. Link uh, has state sigma j, like in the icing model, magnets, the spin can be up or down. So here it will be sigma, it will be the direction of, of the monomers will be plus or minus one. So it will be pointing in the x direction or in the negative x. Okay, uh, and there is an external force pointing in the x direction. So F, F, E, X. So the picture is the following. You have the line. This will be zero. Okay. With X. So we will have the polymer will be in one line. So it's one link on top of each other. But I'm going to draw it in a way you can see it. So it starts from here. Then the first link does like this. The second does like this. So okay, I'm copying from, from the reference book they gave you. The next one will do it like this. The next one, okay, next one is like this. Then do it like this. Then make a change. Then do it like this. Then do it like this. Okay, this is a polymer that's going to be this. Okay. I'm putting the arrows, I'm putting uh, separation because. In reality, this is in a line, okay? But um, this is an illustration. So the first one has, this is the first link, that's sigma one goes to one, it's pointing to the right. The second pointing to the right, but the third is pointing to the left. This is the idea, okay? And the length of the polymer, again, is the sum of all these vectors. So the length is x. Now the length is two. The polymer at the end point is in two. Okay, it's here. One and two. So x is just a times some i j equals one to n of sigma j. Okay, it's the same model that I was talking before, but now the theta is always by half. Okay. There's no freedom for theta. And you tell me, okay, but this is uh, useless because <laughs> we, we did a very more complicated model. Okay, now it comes the difference. What I'll do is I will add um, bending energy contribution in which, which will work as follows. When two links are pointing in opposite directions, there is an energy penalty. There's an energy penalty. Okay, energy. Penalty, which 
I will give it as two gamma if, if, if sigma, sorry, if two consecutive links are pointing in different directions, if, sorry, I don't know, space, <laughs> if sigma i is different to sigma i plus one. Okay. So there's an energy penalty of bending. So when this is the second link goes to right, the third link goes to the left, the here, this will give an extra energy of plus two gamma kVT. It will happen here, and it will also happen here because there is a flipping. So the model will put this in, into the energy. So now the energy won't be just force times x. Remember now we also have the load, so there's a load we are pulling from, from here, okay? So this will be one part of the energy, but we also have to take into account the ordering. So whether the two links are pointing against each other, this will have a penalty, or we, they are pointing together. Okay, how can we do this? It's a very, in a very simple way. Anyway, this is called uh, cooperativity. Parameter. Parameter. Um, so how can we do this? We can do it uh, in a simple way. This is as follows. We will say that the energy of a configuration of configuration. Okay, now how many degrees of freedom do we have? I think either it was close to the answer before, maybe he can say how many degrees of freedom we have now in this model. Just, just look at, at, the, at the figure. You, can, you, you must know, just look at the figure. Because so it is either, yeah, it is either plus one or minus one. Yes, so then? Yeah, and we, it is like two possible configurations. Yes. For, for all, so for each one there are to for n uh, state, so for n, what do we call this? For n link, we have two possible configurations. Yes. So it is two to the power of n. No, <laughs> again, <laughs> no. why? You have to be careful. One thing is the total number of configurations. Yes. The one thing, this is what you are telling me. Another thing is how many degrees of freedom do we have? Ah, oh, you asked about degrees of freedom. <laughs> okay. These are two different oh, things. Okay. Please keep in mind. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Ah, I thought you are talking about the configurations. Total number of configuration is another story. It's another story. That, okay. that you said what? Two to the power n. Yeah. Correct. Because there are two possibilities for each, yeah. and there are n times this. Two to the power n. Okay, maybe I do a box here. So the total number of configurations is two to the power n. But the number of degrees of freedom is n. Okay. You just have to see how I drew the, the this polymer. I was the first line I said left or right, uh, right. Okay. The next left or right, right. So I had only the freedom of choosing one thing. Yes. N times. Okay. Very important. Okay. So the configuration has n degrees of freedom. So the configuration is sigma vector, which is sigma one up to sigma n. That's my configuration. And its energy in this model is the following. E of sigma B. Okay, there is the load pulling. So there will be minus FA sum of J of sigma J. Fine, J equals one to N. And then I add the penalty as follows. This is the bending energy, gamma kVT sum of j equals one, j equals one to n of sigma j, sigma j plus one. Okay, this is what we had before, and this is like in the icing model, there is a term sigma j, sigma j plus one. What is going on here? If these two are one, I have a minus gamma kVT, okay? So it's, it's negative energy. So it's like 
favorable for the system. If this is minus one, this is plus gamma cavity. So there is an extra to gamma cavity when this happens. Okay. This term can be either uh, minus two gamma cavity, sorry, minus gamma cavity. This is when sigma i equals sigma i plus one. Or, sorry, this is minus, so it's favorable. And when they are different, it is plus gamma cavity when sigma i different to sigma i plus one. So there is a penalty of two gamma cavities for uh, twisting the problem. All right, that's our model. So now I repeat the same story and I calculate the partition function. So this is the configuration. The probability for configuration will be e to the minus beta this divided by z. So z, the partition function, will be I sum over all degrees of freedom. So one equals plus minus one up to sigma n plus minus one of e to the minus beta this. So e to the minus beta this, there will be a minus with minus plus beta fa is what I call the the alpha, will be e to the alpha sum j sigma j. And then it will be beta times kvt is one, minus with minus is plus, so it will be plus gamma sum over j of sigma j, sigma j plus one. That's the partition function. And okay, it doesn't look that bad. So I'm summing over n uh, sigmas, and then there's this exponent. So now there's a very nice trick to do this sum. This sum is, is not obvious, eh? it's not, not so simple. But there is a nice trick we can use. The trick is the following. Here, this is a product, as you see. But now, be careful, because this product is easy, e to the alpha sigma 1, e to the alpha sigma 2. But this product is it has correlations. So what we do is the following. The trick will be the following. So we will sum sigma 1, sum sigma n. Maybe you have seen this in another course. I don't know. But let me show you the trick. So I'm writing like this. E alpha sigma 1 plus sigma 2 divided by 2 uh, plus gamma sigma 1 sigma 2. This is the first term. Second term would be E alpha 2 sigma 1, oh sorry, sigma 2 plus sigma 3 uh, plus gamma sigma 2 sigma 3. Okay, you see when I multiply this and this, there is an okay, alpha sigma one half, alpha sigma two half, uh, alpha sigma two half is alpha sigma two. So I have this one. And I continue, continue. At the end, I will need to find the, the mirror of this, alpha sigma one half. But it will come because I will finish with E alpha halves. Sigma n, and I do a turn, I come back to one plus gamma sigma n sigma one. Okay, this is a way of writing this again. It's just a way of rewriting. See, but this way of rewriting has a very nice advantage, and you will see this immediately. So, what comes out? Let's see if I can open this page because I'm in trouble. Uh, it comes out of this is that this has the same structure as this one, and the same structure as this one. So this should remind you, and I'm summing in the first and the second. So if I call this, I can call this as follows: sigma one to sigma n. I will call this T sigma one, sigma two, all this. 
this number. This number, I will call it T, sigma 2, sigma 3. And the last, I will call it T, sigma n, sigma 1. Well, uh, this T is defined as I, as I gave here. So the T's, T, mu nu, remember, sigma 1 and sigma 2 can take two values, minus 1 and 1. T mu nu will be defined as E alpha half mu plus nu plus gamma mu times nu. Okay. And now the question is, what is this type of sum in which I'm multiplying this with this, this with the next, and so on? You remember this from my course some weeks ago, maybe a month ago. I don't remember, but this is a trace of a matrix. Here I'm multiplying. If I sum over sigma 2, Yes, it is the product. This is like the product of n matrices and this taking the trace. It's like taking the trace of the product of n matrices. This is called a tra transfer matrix approach. It's used in transfer matrix. And it's used a lot in um, magnetic systems, like in icing models. But now you can also use it in biophysics, and you see. So then we can use this slight nice property to get a simplification of the calculation, which is uh, very useful to this. Okay, so otherwise the sum is, is really a nightmare. This is really a, a good simplification. So to get is that uh, set becomes the trace of a matrix T to the power N. And this matrix T, I define the element down here, T mono. You can find that um, the matrix T is has elements. It's a four by four matrix, not two by two matrix, because mu and nu can take values minus one and one. Okay, so the matrix is T11, T1 minus one, T minus one, one, T minus one, minus one. This is the matrix. Okay, matrix are appearing all the time here. So T11 is simple because you come here and you put one and one. So it's alpha halves, one plus one. So it's alpha and then one times one, gamma. So it's e to the alpha plus gamma. That's t11. Take the right here. This e to the alpha plus gamma. t minus one minus one, which is here, is e minus alpha plus gamma. And the others are very simple because it's plus one minus one. So this is zero, one minus one, and the other is minus e minus gamma, e minus gamma. That's the matrix. So you have to take this matrix, power to the n, and take the trace. That gives you the participant. However, as I will say, okay, we can do this, but we can also approximate for n large, when n is large, this will be just lambda plus to the power n, where lambda plus is the largest eigenvalue of the matrix. Okay. If not, in general, we can write like this, lambda minus n. This will be the power of the matrix. But when n is large, this will dominate to this one. So I will just forget about the second. This is just what we need. And uh, if you do a little bit of algebra, I can show you that the, the algebra is easy. You can get the eigenvalues. 
the eigenvalues are lambda plus minus. Remember, this is very easy. It comes from doing this equation t minus lambda identity equals to one. This equation gives you eigenvalues as follows. So it can, it's a good exercise. It takes, I don't know, three, four lines. It's not so difficult, but it is, it's good practice for you. E gamma uh, cos hyperbolic alpha plus minus square root of sine hyperbolic square alpha plus e minus four gamma. Is uh, do it as an exercise. It's good. It's good to check if you can do this. Okay. It's not direct. No? It's just algebra, algebra. <laughs> Give it this. All right. And knowing this, you see the largest eigenvalue. This is positive always. So the largest eigenvalue is when you take plus three. So then what you get is that um, Z becomes E to the N gamma times cos hyperbolic alpha plus square root sine hyperbolic square alpha plus A minus four gamma to the power N. So knowing this, you can get the mean length following the same steps. Remember X is just, uh, I think I, I missed something here, A, derivative of Z with respect to alpha. Okay, here there are two parameters, gamma and alpha. You have to do the partial derivative only with respect to alpha. And this, after some algebra, it is not complicated. Remember, because this uh, Z is lambda to the power n. So, sorry, this is log of Z. I forgot. Log of Z. So, log of Z is a n parcel log lambda plus with respect to alpha. That's what you need to do. And log of this is, uh, well, actually, it's not like this. One second. Yes, yes, it's true. It's true like this. Yes. Uh, so this is nothing but a n parcel lambda plus with respect to alpha divided by lambda plus. And if you do the calculation, you get that x average is n a hyperbolic alpha divided by square root sine hyperbolic square alpha plus e minus four gamma. This is a model which has effect of bending and we you can calculate exactly the mean length, which is nice. So when you do gamma equals to zero, we're going to zero. This goes like NA. You get uh, X goes like NA. So when there's no bending, you are pulling, then the, the, the polymer doesn't care if there's correlation with the other. So the best, the least energy that you get is when you, when all of them are, are together. So that's the, the most effective. Case and, and this is what we expect the random walk uh, model. And, and this is it. So, this is uh, all the models I want to explain. This is more involved, as you see, but there are good tricks you can use. In this case, it's all about having a two by two matrix, taking the eigenvalues and making the derivative of the eigenvalues with respect to one parameter. This gives you already the average length in such a more advanced mode, which has already a force which contributes to the energy and also the interaction between the different things. 
but any question? So you, you take a look in the phone and I will, I will do a break. Well, if you have questions, please don't hesitate. Okay, so then I do a pause and at least resume and pass to the whiteboard. All right. So I continue now uh, the second part of the lecture, which will deal with polymers that can uh, go and grow and shrink in time. So, um, so this is polymers as well. Um, is biopolymers? See my screen, no? Yes. Biopolymers. Um, right. Uh, and I will discuss first, um, so this will be models of uh, polymerases. Polymerases. You put here an asterisk of something I forgot, will be stochastic models of polymerases. The first model that I will discuss is a model for a single polymer filament, single polymer filament. Uh, which is used, for instance, to, um, to model the growth of F-actin, remember actin filaments, which appear in the uh, cell cytoskeleton, and they are involved in, in muscle contraction. This will be a very simple model in which we will have the following. Uh, we will have a polymer that has a nucleus, so it has a certain amount, you can imagine, in the cell, it's a polymer, as monomers of the same size. This will be the nucleus of the polymer, which will have a fixed amount of monomers. Here, for example, three. This will be the minus end of the polymer. And then there will be a plus end of the polymer where the polymer can incorporate new monomers. So for example, here, the polymer will have n equals two monomers that are in the plus end. And in the plus end, which uh, I'm, I'm showing here, you can incorporate here monomers one by one. So this will be this is called the plus end, this part, the tip. And here you can incorporate a monomer with rate pi. This is, this is a rate, so it's the number of monomers that are incorporated per unit of time. You can bring from the background one monomer here. Or you can do the opposite, which is taking out one monomer with great epsilon. Okay, so this model is a one dimensional continuous time Markov model with discrete states. Okay, so time is continuous and x is discrete and is one dimensional. It's 1D uh, continuous time. One could even, we know the terminology now very well from the course, is a 1D Markov jump model. Markov jump. Markov jump, remember, means time is continuous and x is discrete. So x now is n. Can be two, three, four, three, two, one. The minimum is zero. Okay. So we'll have n, which is the number of monomers added to the critical nucleus. N of t at any time will be greater or equal than zero. So the max. The maximum is infinite. So we have a polymer that can grow infinitely and the minimum is zero. So this nucleus is like robust, it cannot uh, be depolymerized. And as I said, this is the pi and uh, it's the rate of polymerization. And epsilon is the rate of depolymerization.
These are the two parameters of the system. So now what we can do, this is a Markov jump model. So what we have learned in, in my previous lectures is we can write the master equation. So we write a master equation, equation for the following quantity, which is, uh, I will write it sometimes like this, Pn, which will be Pn of t. This is the probability that at time t, I have a filament of length n. Okay. So this works as follows. As I said, dp and dt, this is the way we write a master equation, will be. So first of all, we can get a polymer of length n from a polymer of length n plus one. So I can get a polymer of size two if I have a polymer of size three and I detach one monomer. This is the, this part, epsilon, p, n plus one. Okay, I depolymerize one and I go from n plus one to n. Okay, depolymerize, remember. I can also polymerize from n minus one. So I have a, a polymer of length one and I polymerize one unit. This will be pi p of n minus one. These are the gain terms, but I can lose. If I have a polymer of length two, I can either depolymerize or polymerize. In both cases, I change the size and I go out of state two. So it will be like this, pi plus epsilon pn. Okay, you guys follow me with this? Yes. Yes. Okay. This, be careful because there is now an absorbing, a reflecting boundary. So this is true for n smaller or equal than one. Very important. For the state zero, we have to do a small modification. So for state zero, we can come from state one. So we, we have this, from state one, we depolymerize. So this is not correct. <laughs> this is him worse. So this is depolymerization from state one. And then we also have, okay, we don't have p minus one, it doesn't exist. Okay, this term doesn't exist here because we don't have p and p minus one. What we have also is polymerization from C. We cannot depolymerize from C. This doesn't exist anymore. Uh, again, it, it exists this one, polymerization from C. So pi p c. Okay. This is the so-called reflecting boundary condition. Reflecting boundary at n equals zero. Okay, you follow me in this? No? Yes, yeah. yes. Okay, that's fine. Um, so now this is the master equation. And uh, first of all, remember that this is normalized, but the way it's normalized is n is also only eta v than zero. So we have to sum n from zero to infinity. At all times, we can be in all possible states, which is from zero to infinity. This is equal to one for all t's, no? For any t, greater than one zero. This is the normalization of this, which should hold. What I'll do now is from this equation, I can compute a, it's called mean field equation for the mean length. So what I can do is the following. I will do a equation or mean field equation. Equation for the average of n. This is the average length. Now remember, we know p n of t. I haven't solved it, but if you know it, the average length will be n times p n of t. So I'm averaging n with the solution of the master equation. n equals zero to infinity. Okay, so I have this equation, and if I multiply by n here, on the left, I will have this exactly, okay? So if I multiply here by n, let me just put it in a, in a different color. I multiply by n, and then I multiply also here by n, multiply by n, by n, 
And now I do the sum, something here. Sum, sum, sum. And the sum, you see that what I have on the left is like DDT of this quantity because N is not time dependent. It's this with this time dependent. So if I do T dt of n, I check and write it here, d dt of n is n times d p n dt. Okay. So and what I have here is the time derivative of the average n. So from this equation, I get now that um, the change of the average length with respect to time is this sum, which is epsilon that I take it out, sum from n equal one to infinity. Okay, I could put uh, yeah, n equal one because here I'm summing n greater equal than one of n p n plus one, then I have plus pi, the sum, n equals one to infinity of n, p n minus one, and then I have minus p plus epsilon, sum n p n, sum n p n is what I have here, is average n, so I have pi plus epsilon average of n. This is, the last one is, is because I'm mixing n with pn, that's average n. Here is n with n plus one, that's not so simple. That's not average n. And n with pn minus one is not average n. And this what I'm, I'm going to try to solve now. So this and these terms can be um, simplified greatly because of the following. So what I'll do, uh, okay, give me a second. I think I did, did everything well. Uh, one second, epsilon, yes, okay. Actually, some terms from here can be canceled with some terms from here. So what I, I will do now is to write this sum explicitly and also this sum. So um, if, I, if I may, I will write this one with epsilon and this one explicitly. So what are these two terms? You will see it simplifies a lot. So the first one, uh, let me write it explicitly, it's epsilon, and then I have this. This is, uh, let me write some terms. N equals one is one P2. We have P2. The same, next term is two P3. P3 plus etc. okay? This is the first part, three P4, etc. Then it will be minus, this one, which will be uh, is the average n, so it will be 1p1, 2p2, 3p3, etc. p1 plus 2p2 plus 3p3, etc. So these two sums all together simplify a lot because you have p2 minus 2p2 is minus p2. 2p3 minus 3p3 is minus p3. So it becomes, all this becomes epsilon minus p1 minus p2 minus p3 etc so this is minus epsilon the sum of the p's so you can see that this is minus epsilon the sum of the p's and p0 is missing so this is one minus p0 okay you can do it at home it's, it's simple so this plus this is epsilon with a minus one minus epsilon. The other, the other two. So now I'll, I'll do the the sum I will uh, show in orange. This one and this one with this the sum in orange. Uh, this one becomes pi, and I have n p n minus one. So the first term is one p zero. The second is two p one plus like this. But sometimes you see writing things explicitly helps you. Minus P1 plus P2 plus etc. 
So you see P0, 2P1 minus P1 is P1. Then it will be 3P2 minus 2P2 is P2. So this is pi, P1, sorry, P0 plus P1. So it, this is the normalization condition. It's all the, all the P's. So this is just pi. Okay. So this sum becomes simple because all this, which look very ugly, becomes um, just pi minus epsilon one minus P0. This is the average growth of the polymer. So if we know P0, look, this was a monster. We had a master equation with infinite variables. So now the average growth, it depends only on the probability for the state zero. That's the only thing we need, okay? So from this, we get uh, mainly the following. This was the equation and just derived dt equals pi minus epsilon plus epsilon p0, okay? Which can also be written in, in, in different ways. But um, what is important is we need to know what is this. So if we know this, we solve the problem. Okay, but I didn't tell you what is p0. So now, <laughs> what I would like to know is what is p0. So in the stationary limit, in the stationary limit, give me a second because I'm taking um, my notes. Stationary limit, we will get dpn dt equals to zero. So what will be the stationary solution of P0? So P0 will change in time, but at some point it will reach stationary value. And in stationary, I take the master equation and I equate to zero. So the first one was like this, stationary plus pi. This was what I was getting. I'm just copying this one. And I'm putting this to zero, this to zero. So this is pi p n minus one stationary minus epsilon plus pi p n stationary is equal to zero. And um, the other one in the stationary limit, this is zero. So e, epsilon p one equals pi p zero. Epsilon p one equals stationary by P0 stationary. This is the master equation in stationary. So to solve this, I would like to know what is P and P. To solve this, we do an assumption. So the assumption will be on the ansatz. The assumption will be that P and P is C lambda to the power n. Okay, I will, I will explore if this type of solution works. So I plug in this here, here, and here. So what I'm doing is I take this, and I put it here, I put it here, and I put it here. So this one will have n plus one, n minus one, and here n. So what I get is uh, the following equation. Epsilon, lambda n, n plus one, plus pi lambda n minus one minus epsilon plus pi lambda n equals to zero. Okay, so now I like to get out the ends. So what I do is I multiply by lambda minus n plus one. So then here, the n goes away and I have lambda squared. Here, minus n with n goes away and I have lambda to the power zero. And here I have lambda to the power one. So it becomes a second order equation. It becomes epsilon lambda squared minus epsilon plus pi lambda plus pi equals to zero. Okay, this is a second order. Um, equation. All of you can solve this because it's lambda squared, lambda, and nothing. So 
um, this is extremely simple. I will define R, which is pi over epsilon. So I divide all by epsilon and it becomes lambda squared minus one plus R. This parameter will be important. Is the rate, so it's the ratio between the polymerization rate and the depolymerization rate, okay? This is an important number in this problem. We'll see later, okay? This is lambda plus and divided by epsilon, so this is R equals to zero. This is the second order equation, which is very, very simple to solve, okay? We have to solve it in lambda, and this is extremely simple to solve. So the solutions are, you can do the, you can find it yourself, are one and R. These are the two solutions, uh, but not all the solutions that you get here are physically relevant because just check that, um, sorry, check that if the distribution is like this, it has to be normalized. So normalization, there are two solutions, lambda equals one, lambda equals r. If you normalize, we have uh, the sum, the sum of n of pn, that's t, n equals from zero to infinity. This will be, this should be one. This is c that goes out, the sum n equals zero to infinity of lambda to the power n. Okay, what type of sum is this? Anyone can, can tell you something? You have any idea of which? It's a geometric series. It's a geometric series. This. And the geometric series, so if I put a one here. It diverges. This diverges. So this one, yes. we have to discard it. It is very important that not all the solutions are physically relevant. This one yeah. is useless. This one diverges. So the only one that makes sense is R, but R should be smaller than one. Otherwise, it makes no sense. Yes. So we need that this is smaller than one. This is important. And if this is more than one, this will be able, we can, we, we can sum this because it will be C, this is R now. So it will be one divided by one minus R equals to one. And then it works. So in the end, C, well, actually you can call this, uh, and C will be one minus R. And that's it. And this is possible. Okay, one minus R, which is one minus pi divided by epsilon. So this is an important condition. Normalization sets that R must be smaller than one. So this means that the polymerization rate should be smaller than the depolymerization rate. Important then. Very important that this one should be dominating this one. Why? Well, this, this is clear because if this one dominates, the polymer will grow infinite, infinitely long. So N will diverge. However, if depolymerization dominates, the distribution, so there will be a push in this direction to be, be zero, but there is an, a reflecting wall here. So in the end, we will get a distribution that we do like this. Okay, this will be n, and this will be p of n. This is what it will come out now. So otherwise, the distribution is, is not bounded. So when we have this, what we get, so th this is uh, the normalization constant, c. So p n is t is this, this c, which is this, is one minus pi divided by epsilon. This is C. And now it's lambda to the power n. But lambda is R, is pi divided by epsilon. So it's pi divided by epsilon to the power n. And this is the stationary distribution. So this one is now the final result. This is 
stationary distribution. And uh, what you need to know is that this one, okay, is for n greater than than zero. And this is called geometric distribution. Yeah. Geometric distribution. So the distribution is a geometric. And uh, this is nice because you can do a lot of calculations, but if you plot this as a function of n, it looks, okay, it's not an exponential, but it looks like an exponential because n now can be zero, can be one, two, it's like a discrete exponential. So it does like this, okay. This is the geometry distribution. Of course, whatever is in the middle doesn't exist here. The distribution is just like this, okay. This is called geometric distribution. So because the depolymerization rate is winning, it's pushing in this direction, but there is a wall. That's why you have this type of distribution. Does it make sense to you? Okay, this is an exact. Sorry? Yes, it makes sense. Okay, so I will finish now with the last uh, last piece which will be just calculating the mean sorry the mean stationary length well this should be obvious now because we know the distribution is a geometric if you know the mean of a geometric that's it basically but we will do it explicitly in any case so the mean will be positive it won't be zero the distribution has a maximum is zero, but the mean is a positive number. We can do this explicitly. The mean at the stationary is the sum npn stationary, n equals zero to infinity. So we know this, and this was one minus pi divided by epsilon times pi divided by epsilon to the n. So it becomes this pi divided by epsilon sum of n infinity n pi divided by epsilon to the power n, okay? Again, uh, okay, this looks like a geometric series, but it is not because there is this n in front of it, but you can use this property. If you take a geometric series and take the derivative with respect to the argument, infinite, this is, we take the derivative with, n, with respect to r, so this is the sum, n equals zero to infinity of n r n minus one. Okay, and this we can write it as one over r. The sum n equals zero to infinity of r n r to the n. I just took the minus one like this. You see, this is the sum we are interested. In. It's n r to the power n. This one. Okay, so. What is this? This is d dr, and if r is more than one, we know the result of this sum, which is one divided by one minus r. And the derivative of this, so I'm, I'm doing the same calculation in two parts. One is I just take the derivative in r, and the second is I do the sum, I take the derivative explicitly. And this is one divided by one minus r squared. Okay, so this should be equal to this, which means that it's a very simple mathematical property you can derive. It means that the sum n equals zero to infinity of n r to the n is, I move this up, so it's r divided by one minus r squared. Okay, this is just a mathematical property you can find in all the books but that you can derive yourself, okay? <laughs> so now I am here, I continue, use this property, and I get that this is one minus pi divided by epsilon times r, which is pi over epsilon, divided by one minus pi over epsilon squared. So this one goes with this, and final result is that n 
st equals pi over epsilon divided by one minus pi over epsilon. This is the final result. Then you can put it in red because it's important, which means that this makes sense when pi is more than epsilon. So this is greater than zero. It's well defined when pi is more than epsilon. Otherwise, this is negative and it's very strange <laughs> because I said in the model, n is positive. And secondly, when pi goes to epsilon, I put it like this because it goes from below, in that limit, pi goes to epsilon, this is one, one minus one is zero. So this goes to infinity and st goes to infinity. So when you have a polymer, there's a wall and the, okay, this is the polymer and up to now and the uh, detachment and the attachment rates are the same, they are equal, the average length becomes infinity. This is because it is like um, unbiased random walk and the unbiased random walks have these properties. And the average length diverges when you have equal um, forward and backward rates, but a reflecting wall, okay? This is important. So this only makes sense when it is more likely to polymerize than to depolymerize, which is what we saw here, so, okay. So with this, I finish this first model with uh, fluctuations. And uh, in the next lecture, I hope, uh, actually I advance a lot today. In the next lecture, I will give you a, a couple of more models, one for acting and another for micro tools, also regarding fluctuations and growth, okay? So any question, doubts? Uh, can you send us this, the PDF of this? Uh, of this? Yes, uh, of the whiteboard. Ah, uh, yes, yes. Okay. Uh, I can do it. Give me a second. I can do screenshots. And I send you. Um, give me a second. Because I always forget to do this. Thank you. And this one. Yes, okay. <laughs> 